Good evening. This is a circuit that melts away when its work is done. And here is a tool that delves into the deep web and the dark web to find human traffickers. These are the kinds of robots that could one day navigate through a damaged nuclear reactor and prevent a meltdown. This is a vehicle designed to withstand a massive blast so our soldiers can walk away uninjured. And here in my hand, I have a neutron detector and a gamma ray detector. It's small enough that first responders can carry it everywhere, creating a city scale network so that they can detect nuclear materials before a terrorist detonates a bomb. These are just a few things. These are just a few of the things that we're working on today at DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And tonight I want to talk with you about one of our areas of work that is going to stretch our minds in completely new ways. It's the area of neurotechnology. And this is where breakthroughs in electronics and neuroscience and algorithms are coming together to enable a new kind of seamless symbiosis between people and technology. It's going to exhilarate us. It's going to make us deeply uncomfortable. And it could even cause us to reassess what it means to be human. Now, why is a defense research agency even thinking about this? The answer to that begins in 1957. That's the year that this happened. The shock in the United States when the Soviets launched Sputnik at the height of the Cold War was palpable. And in its wake, our country created DARPA to prevent technological surprise. Our predecessors quickly realized that the best way to do that is to create some surprises of our own. And over time, we've done that in two different ways. Sometimes we see a really tough military challenge and we go after it with a revolutionary approach. So we made it possible to create a stealth aircraft like this that to an enemy radar looks as tiny as this. But a different motivation drove DARPA's development of the ARPANET and the internet of powerful chip technologies and advanced materials. Here we saw bubbling pots of research that were still immature, but that allowed us to dream about groundbreaking capabilities. And with the private investment and the entrepreneurship that followed, we were able to enable the incredibly rich and complex information environment that we're all living in every day. So today, when we see those early signs of new technological surprise, we go after them. And one of the areas where we're seeing those signs today is neurotechnology. Because think about it, we are surrounded by exabytes of data, networks that operate at trillions of bits per second, and, and here, a different prodigious capability in each of our brains, many tens of billions of neurons able to do things that no computer can do. But our link to the information realm is a keyboard and a mouse. It's sort of like two supercomputers that are relegated to talking to each other like this. <laughs> it takes you right back, doesn't it? <laughs> so neurotechnology has the potential to change that. And our work here begins by focusing on the problems of wounded military service members. It, as we do that research, though, it opens the door to something more. Let me show you. Please meet Nathan and Jan. These two are each paralyzed below the neck. In the study that they're participating in, they've each had small arrays placed on their motor cortex. And from those arrays, the researchers in this lab are able to pick up the electrical signals from those specific neurons, translate them in real time, and use them to drive a prosthetic arm. And this is what's happening here. Jan is thinking about moving her own arm. She's trying to get that chocolate bar within reach. And she got it. 
Jan is amazing, and you know, when she did this, this was the first time since she's been paralyzed that she's been able to feed herself a bite of chocolate. When Jan started this study, that was one of the first things she wanted to do, which tells you about this woman's priorities. I like that. <laughs> so, you know, because Jan can use her thoughts to control that arm, she can use her thoughts to control other kinds of tools, too, even an airplane. And in fact, Jan got to try out a flight simulator. Just by thinking about it, she was able to do controlled dives, and she even took a spin in an F-35 fighter jet. So Jan, in the work that she's been doing, she's able to move things. She can move that arm, but she couldn't feel the chocolate bar that it held in, it, in its hand. Nathan also has implants on his sensory cortex, and here he's able to receive electrical signals that allow him to experience the sense of touch. Watch as the researcher presses the, me the mechanical fingers here. Index. Pinky. Middle. Uh, index and middle. And that's the first time. And that's the first time that Nathan has experienced the sensation of his fingers being touched for over a decade. Now, Jan and Nathan are only part of the story of neurotechnology today. We're also working to try to repair the kind of memory loss that can come with traumatic brain injury. And when we do that, we also open the door to the possibility of enhancing memory or accelerating learning. We're working to fix the neural misfirings and the imbalances that can result in psychiatric disease. And that work opens the door to the possibility of customized mental health states. And we're working to use the peripheral nervous system to monitor and to maintain the organs of the body. And that opens the possibility to people being able to directly control their physiological functions, for example, regulating your own, your own blood pressure. Now, this is research. It's not yet robust capability, but already it allows us to dream about a future in which we will have harnessed the power of human brains and the power of technology together. First, to control our individual capabilities, but also to start weaving an intimate ecosystem of interconnected capabilities. Now, with these big possibilities come some big choices. In a possible future, neurotechnologies could enable a, a warfighter to focus under fire by turning his heart rate down, or to sense an odorless biological threat, or to directly and intuitively control a bevy of military systems that could keep the adversary at bay. In that future, will the military ban neural enhancement the way we ban performance-enhancing steroids today? Or conversely, is there a future in which neural enhancement becomes a condition of military service? In a possible future, neural techno neurotechnologies could enable people across society to overcome depression, to boost our physical health, to learn complex tasks in a flash, to connect among ourselves in new and deeper ways. In that future, will society think about neurotechnologies the way we currently think about uh, SAT test prep or braces or uh, even laser eye surgery? We're, we just think it's a personal choice. Or, is there even a time when we can start to imagine a growing gap, a disturbing gap, between the neural enhancement haves and have-nots? Could some basic level of neural enhancement come to be seen as a right and not just a privilege? These are some of the choices ahead. And they are choices for all of us, not just for the technologists among us. At DARPA, we pursue these powerful technologies 
because of their power. That's our mission. It's what we do for our country. But we know that the very power of these technologies means that they can be used for good or for ill. So this story of possible futures, how it turns out depends on you and you and you. These big choices belong to all of us. And as we shape our future with these extraordinary technologies, in the choices we make, we will reveal who we are and who we will become as human beings. Thank you.